Hey guys, welcome to Backstage with PV3. So excited about this week's episode. You guys are in for a treat. And so welcome to everybody that's here with me live. If you're here with me live on Twitter space, on Instagram, wherever we're streaming this, tell me where you're chiming in from. I want to know where you're from. Tell me what you're excited about today. In today's episode, I am stoked about our guest today in today's episode. Um, this gentleman I got introduced to a couple of years ago, and I'll tell you in a short period of time has become a person who's been a mentor to me. And, uh, you know, it's amazing when, when God put, brings people into your life that, that can help make you better, help you grow, help you become more of who you um, desire to be, like the being part of things and not the doing part of things. Like we're human beings, not hum human doings. And I got to tell you, this, this gentleman is incredible in, in just helping me become more of who I am and who God made me. And so I'm excited about today. But before I bring him on, I just want to take you behind the scenes of two things that I think can be useful to all of our listeners today on the show. Two things. Let me take you backstage right now on two things that are going to serve you. Backstage on number one that's serving you right now while this episode is being recorded. It's in the month of September. And we are beginning to prepare our annual planning for 2024, meaning we're actually getting our game plan ready for 2024. And we used to do it in December, but the reason why December is tough is because now all of a sudden you, you, the holidays hit you and you, you don't get prepared for the things that you need to do to make sure that your plan hits. And so I want to encourage you as you go into Q4, Q4 of your life, whatever year that is, begin to start the annual planning process. Right now, upstairs in my home, I've got my leadership team from all across the country that's meeting, and I took a break to make sure that I was backstage with you guys today, but I really want you to begin to think about the annual planning process, not just for your business, but for your personal life, for your personal life. My wife and I leave next weekend to go really begin to plan for our 2024. We get away for a weekend. We get a house. We get away from the kids and we plan our 2024. Let me tell you the five areas that we plan. This might be useful for, to, useful for you. Is this helpful? Is this helpful, guys? Yeah. Number one, plan around your business. Plan around your business. And if you're a solopreneur, when I was a solopreneur, just this week, just this week, I, I was going through my office and cleaning out my office, and I found the goals of my business from like seven or eight years ago. I found the goals of my business from seven or eight years ago, guys. And it's so profound to see those goals because um, here's my first full year in business in 2003. And if you're if you're if you're if you're listening to this, you can't see it. But if you can see right here, type in the chat how much my business did in its very first year. Type in the chat if you see that. What what did my business do in the very first year? Two thousand two hundred and forty two or forty three dollars. This is it. That's it. And I love it that you guys, I want to share that because so many, like you, you, you see what right now is, but you don't even see what it was in 2023. There's many of you that, that, that are going to do better than that this next year or this year in your first year in business. But the big part of that is every year since 2003, I've gotten into this habit of Q4 of planning business. And then my wife and I plan in four domains. We plan in our faith domain, we plan in our health domain, we plan in our relationship domains, meaning our kids, our relationship, our friends, our church, our community, colleagues across the United States, friends of us don't let, like we plan around our relationships and what we're going to do to really be with our, our, our relationships this year. And the fourth area we plan, which I think a lot of people miss, is around the, 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 the finances. And not just the making of money, how you're going to multiply your money, and actually how you're going to make your money matter by where you're going to give it away. 
and how you're going to bless people with those resources that when you are a blessing. And so we plan in those five domains. And right now, I want you to know we're in the planning process. Leadership teams upstairs, spending three days here, yesterday, today, and tomorrow, and next week, and my wife and I get away for three days. And we really set the course that we're feeling for the next year. And I want to encourage all of you today to do that. I want to encourage all of you today to do that. Cool? Cool, cool, cool. I love it. I love it. I love it. Um, and so I am excited. I cannot, I'm excited for today because you guys are going to be blessed and served. Instagram, Twitter space, Zoom, and everywhere we're streaming this. Um, I'm stoked to bring this, this gentleman on. And I actually just pulled one of his books out that I haven't read that I'm about to read. But I got the chance to meet um, Erwin McManus through a good friend of mine by the name of Joel Marion. If you don't know Joel Marion, go follow him online. Um, he's not only an incredible friend, he's one of the most generous people. Him and his, his lovely wife, Kat, just got married. And um, Joel said, you're going to love Erwin. And I had met Erwin once. But I remember sitting in Irwin um, in, a, in a breakfast meeting and listening to Irwin and thinking, man, this guy is a genius. This guy is genius. And just over the course of the last four years since 2019, um, I've, been, I've, been, I've been able to um, consume a lot of his content and a lot of what he puts out to the world. And just incredible. Um, a lot of folks know him as, as a pastor of Mosaic Church in, in California, but I think of him as a pastor to a lot of folks in business world and the entrepreneur world. And I am so excited today to welcome backstage with PV3 to our live show and this show that gets put out a lot of places, my friend and one of my mentors, um, Mr. Erwin McManus. Are you there, Erwin? Pete, I'm right here, man. It's good hey, to man. See you. How are you? I'm doing so good. So good. And right. LA is a, uh, we're having a beautiful day here today. I mean, come on, man. I love your backdrop there. And I love all of the, I love all of the, the setup there, man. Is that, is that new? Uh, you know, I, I've been collecting graphic novels since I was a kid. Daredevil's one of my iconic guys because he's the man without fear. Um, the world sees him as a guy with a disability, but he has uh, hidden secret superpowers so I just, I've always, uh, I loved, and I also love that Matt Murdock was a guy who struggled with his faith and was really driven with his belief in uh, God. And uh, yeah, so I, I, yeah, so Daredevil is sort of like my, my guy. Yeah. Well, if, if I want to ask you a question, and then we're going to get into a topic that I think is important for this audience, because there, we talk to them about four things. We talk to them about this, the, the component of, you know, being a being a world class communicator, and we're going to dive into that bucket today. We talked to them about the power of having products and services that they can get out into the world. You and I had a very powerful conversation about that at one of the masterminds we met. You and your son said, Pete, that was so valuable for us to think how you were thinking. And so we talk about that every week on the show. We talk about other people's stages, and then we talk about building your own stages. And the beautiful thing in your world is you've done all four of those. And I want to drill in on one of those today, but I also want to drill in one of the things that gets in the way from any of those four, which is people's minds too. Like just the way that they think is one of the biggest things that doesn't prevent, doesn't allow them to do any of the four. But I want to start with a question. I don't know why this question is coming to me, but for the folks that don't know you out there, help us know. I want to know who is Erwin McManus? Oh, wow. Well, that's a, a nice big question. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, just quick backdrop. Uh, I'm an immigrant uh, to the United States from a small country called El Salvador. Uh, Spanish was my first language. I learned English here in the States. Uh, my name, Erwin McManus, is German and Irish, but it's just an alias uh, that my, um, my stepdad uh, gave me when uh, he was involved in creative underground economies and needed an alias to escape um, a very, very passionate Italian family pursuing him. And uh, um, so I always grew up with a, a, a sense of uh, a loss of identity, of trying to figure out who I was. I was an outsider and um, I grew up irreligious. My mom was always on a spiritual journey of some kind. She uh, was, I remember bringing a Buddha home, becoming Jewish. Uh, having a Roman Catholic um, influence. And so I was always a person on a, on a 
just a personal journey. Uh, when I was um, 10 years old, I ended up in a psychiatric chair and uh, in and out of a hospital uh, for about six months um, and, and just began reading books written by guys like Isaac Asanoff and Robert Heinlein and Andre Norton and Ray Bradbury. And they helped me begin to expand my imagination to begin to consider the possibility of there being more to this world than you know, meets the eye. So I read every mythology book in the library by the time I was in sixth grade and eventually became a philosopher and um, became a Socratic in college and really began trying to build my life on the principles of Socrates. And then through that, ended up um, having a life-changing encounter with, um, with Jesus. And um, having a really irreligious background, I decided I needed to know if the principles in the scriptures actually worked. So I spent the next 10 years of my life working with drug cartels and um, the world of gangs and prostitution and drugs and, um, and just wanted to try to understand how to uh, bring realistic change into people's lives. While I was in, at Chapel Hill, I began studying um, the extremes of human psychology, abnormal psychology from neurosis to psychosis to genius. And I became really fascinated with human genius and what, um, what, what really are the limits of human capacity um, are um, the perceived ceiling of human potential really there. And, um, and so I just began a, a personal journey over the last 45 years of understanding how to optimize um, a person's potential, their talent, their intelligence, their, their skill set, their character. Yeah. And then 30 years ago, I came to LA, never intended to do um, the work of a pastor. Um, I ended up starting a community called Mosaic in a nightclub that Prince owned. And it was really a, a spiritual space for my friends who were atheists, agnostics, Buddhists, Hindus, Muslims, um, who just didn't believe in God and would not enter into any kind of religious space. And it just became an incredible journey for me and my wife, Kim. And I've been married 40 years. I have a son named Aaron and a daughter named Mariah, who are both adults. And I, I, I love helping people discover their untapped potential and capacity. And, um, and I think I've, I've, I've spent my life trying to convince people there's genius inside of them that will remain untapped if they don't understand how to build the right internal structures for success. That's yeah, my summary. That's my God, life. This is, this is unlike a conversation that you will ever hear on Backstage with PB3. Like Twitter, Instagram, everywhere we're live right now. Like, give me a few thoughts on that. Like, I see some of the thoughts on here. Like, wow, I would think Irwin's 100 years old by the life that he's already <laughs> lived. But let, please don't misinterpret what he said. He understands this capacity limitation that so many of us put on our lives that where he lives right now and what he's accomplished is more than most people would accomplish in two or three or four lifetimes. And we're going to dive into that today. We're going to get into his mind today where we don't all have to be geniuses like him to think like a genius. Like he's going to give us some of those resources and tools that are going to help us today, which I'm so excited about guys. But Erwin, before we do that, so I'm going to go, I'm going to tackle three big things. I want people to know who you are because I think they're just, just like, wow. But the second thing is that you've communicated with a lot of people. You've communicated with atheists and Buddhists and Christians and drug cartels and people in prison and, you know, been communicating with your wife for 40 years, your beautiful bride, Kim. And what I've learned about you is if you don't know this, Irwin is world class in communication, world class in communication. I went and bought the domain. I couldn't believe it was available worldclasscommunicator.com. I couldn't believe that was available a couple months <laughs> ago, a few months ago. Well, Irwin is one of those that gets bucketed in there. And I could count on one or two hands the people that could get bucketed in there. But Erwin, one of the ways you've been able to do that is like beginning to understand an element of communication that does, isn't, doesn't get talked about often, often, which is frequency. And mm -hmm. so I know there's a lot there and we could spend two or three days with the audience there, but is there like an overview that you could really help us understand? I believe there's seven levels. Is that right? Or seven uh, dynamics to communicate yeah. frequency? Well, what, What's interesting uh, is that my uh, my son Aaron asked me to put together 
a, a master class on communication. My wife's been begging me to do it for probably 30 years, and I just never would. And so we created a, a six-hour master class called the Art of Communication. And in it, 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 I just break down the whole domain of what makes a person, I think, a dynamic, transcendent uh, communicator. And, and you know how you do in the, um, in the whole marketing world, you always want to have some free gift, right? You know, and so my son came back and said, hey, dad, could you create like a 15 minute product as a gift we could give away to people? And so all weekend long, I just dove in and started thinking through communication. And, and all I can, ex I don't know how I explain it, but I, can't, I went to the sort of like transcendent state. I didn't sleep for like three days. My wife saw me at five in the morning, drenched in sweat. And I was just um, writing down, best I can explain it, um, what became another five-hour course called The Seven Frequencies of Communication. And when you begin to understand that human beings operate on frequencies, and I, you know now we know that everything is energy, and we're trying to understand that, that everything dynamically relates in frequencies, and that when humans communicate, they're communicating in positive and negative frequencies. And those frequencies actualize different uh, potentially transcendent activities inside of another person's soul. Mm. And, and what, one of the things I think is really important to remember is that human beings are open loop creatures, which means we're affected by our external environment. And, and so if you were not an open loop creature, Pete, if you were discouraged, you would stay discouraged. No one could encourage you because no one could get encouragement into you. And, but what's interesting is, that when you're an open loop creature, have you ever walked into a room and you were really down, but everyone else was up and optimistic and hopeful and you left hopeful and optimistic. And it's because you're an open loop creature. So you begin absorbing the positive energy and frequencies of the people there. And in the same way, you've probably been in a room where you were optimistic and positive and somebody came in and they were just so negative and so pessimistic that you left depressed. And it's because you're an open loop creature. And the moment you understand that, you understand the power of human communication. It's why human beings operate in, in such a dynamic way in environments where they can get what they need inside of their soul. And so I identified seven signature frequencies that people communicate from. I'm not saying that they're uh, you know, that they're all inclusive, but they're the dominant frequencies that we work from. And not only are there seven frequencies, but each one of these frequencies has a shadow frequency, mm. which can have an incredibly destructive and negative effect on human communication and 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 uh, personal health. Let and me so jump let me just there. so you're saying there's a there's a positive and a light side to it, but there's also a shadow and a dark side to each of the seven. There is. I, I don't know if you've ever seen the so, the show Secession, but um, when I first um, presented the seven frequencies to my audience, I said, send me any TV show and we'll break down the characters and identify their frequencies. Well, everyone, it seemed like send me two shows, Friends and Secession. I didn't <laughs> know Friends was still a thing. People still love Friends. And, uh, and, and, and so I decided to go ahead and break down Secession. And I thought, oh no, my paradigm doesn't work. This, this framework doesn't work. I couldn't find a single one of the seven frequencies in succession. And so I had a little panic attack. And, <laughs> and then I stepped back and I thought, wait a minute, look for the negative frequencies. And then suddenly it, it erupted in my brain. I saw all seven frequencies instantly in every character in succession. And then I began realizing that most of the, the shows that are really popular only use negative frequencies. They rarely use the positive frequencies of communication, which of course then transcends into everyday life because we're being modeled communication frequencies that we take on because we think they're necessary for success. So no wonder so many marriages are ending in divorce. No, no wonder so many businesses end up in massive conflict with partners. No, no wonder so many of our relationships end up broken and disconnected because we're learning negative frequencies of communication. So let me just, I maybe highlight a couple of them if you want. Man, Aaron, I would love, we have the time. I would love for the Cliff Notes version of them. Like, I don't know how hard that is for you, but like I can, I can see the comments everywhere and people want to know them. So whatever you can do, man, you can highlight 
A I'll few work from the most seven. I'll work from the most common to the least common. And um, I think the most common positive frequency is called a motivator. And if you watch Instagram or if you, um, you know, if you're on TikTok and you listen to different people, if you're li listening to different voices, one of the most popular frequencies is the motivator. They're the person that tells you that you can do it. They're an encourager. They're enthusiastic. They're an inspirer. And, and the, the, the POV of a, of a motivator is people need me to lift them up. And, and people listen to you because you make them feel good and uh, about life and about themselves. And I, I think one of the most common positive um, frequencies is a motivator. And they, they never tell you what's wrong with you. They never tell you what you need to change. They don't tell you what you need to fix. They just tell you you're awesome. And, uh, and what's really, really interesting is that when they're authentic, you believe them. And, uh, you know, and, and one of the interesting things that is when you're a motivator, the marker is, do others look to you for encouragement? Mm -hmm. it, it does. I, I want to highlight, it doesn't matter what you think you are. It matters how other people will respond to who you are in this. And one of the best ways of knowing what frequency you use is how people respond to you, what they look to you for in those frequencies. And, and what, what you find is a motivator has um, a basic need of energy. They believe the room needs to be energized. And, and when you have a motivator, there's energy in the room. They, they create a sense of enthusiasm and inspiration and excitement. But really, the higher need of a motivator is self-belief. They are convinced what people need is to believe in themselves. And, and you can look at sometimes like a, a dominant voice. So I think of a Jamie Kerm Lima, who is a, a, her first book was Believe It, and her new book is Worthy. And when you listen to Jamie, she's just going to tell you, you matter. You know, you're awesome. You can change the world. You are worthy. You have value. And it's like getting in this soul jacuzzi where you're like, I feel so good about myself. And when you let a voice like that into your soul, you start believing in you more than you ever believed in you. And I, I, I love motivators. The shadow of a motivator is a performer. Mm. And what is, to me, fascinating is that it's, it's not like one person is a motivator and the other person is a performer. I think the motivator always has the temptation of moving into the performer. And when you're not doing well, or when you're not ready for that moment, or maybe you, you know you're, you're maybe you just had a fight with your wife or your husband, and you're not in your authentic self, and all of a sudden you find yourself performing, and you're inspiring the room, you're motivating the room, you're encouraging the room, but it's not coming from that authentic frequency. So now you're performing for the room, and one of the best ways for me to help a person understand a negative frequency is that it is a positive frequency when you're focused on what you can do for the audience and it becomes a shadow frequency when you focus on what the audience can do for you. Oh, that's good. And you know, so many times uh, you can hear someone on stage and you realize they're desperate for affirmation. Like they're desperate for love. They're desperate for information or inspiration and, and encouragement and esteem. And you can see that shadow. And one of the challenges sometimes is that performers elevate fast and performance is rewarded. It's not actually punished. And so there are a lot of speakers who become really successful as performers and you never get to see their authentic selves. You never really get to know them for who they really are because they've learned how to succeed as a performer. A second frequency I would highlight is the challenger. Now, if there are a lot of motivators in social media, there are, there are almost an equal number of challengers. Now, the, the, uh, the motivator is the person that says, you can do this. You, and they elevate your self-belief and they build that, that intensity of energy inside of you. But the challenger is the person who's the, the confronter, they're the persuader, they're the exhorter, they're, um, they're, they're the person that feels like they have to disrupt the status quo of your life. Uh, people listen to challengers because you inspire them to be more and to do more. And, uh, and, and so you can listen for just five seconds, you know, a challenger, that challenger is the one telling you, you know, you owe you, you owe yourself more. You can do this, you know, and uh, let pain inspire you. And, you know, and, and when you're listening to a challenger, it's almost like you, you feel like you're growing muscles the very moment you're listening to them. And, 
you can know you're a challenger when people look to you to raise the standard. And the basic need for challengers, they believe what people need is courage. But the high need is they believe people need is calling or mandate. And that challenger is always going to challenge you to take on your highest calling, your highest mandate, that, that, that highest destiny. And one of the tests of knowing if you're a challenger is do other people look to you to call them to more, to a higher standard? And one of the interesting things about a challenger is that they're so powerful, but the shadow of a challenger is a manipulator. And when a person is an intrinsic challenger, but the energy is focused toward themselves, they begin to manipulate people to do what they need people to do, what they want people to do, and what serves them best. When the challenger is working at an optimal level with a frequency that is positive and healthy, they're not giving people the vision for their life. They're giving people the courage to step into the vision for their life. When a challenger moves into a negative frequency, they become a manipulator. And maybe some of you have experienced that when someone's calling you out and you feel almost as if you're being controlled by the weight of their personality and presence and opinion to do something you don't want to do. And because it's what they want you to do. And it's a really challenging um, frequency because it's so strong and so powerful. And I'm always a little personally apprehensive when I'm in a room and someone says, I want everyone to do this. I want everyone to do this. I want everyone to do this. And frankly, the moment someone says that, I don't do it. Mm. Because it's an, it's an environmental challenger trying to take control over people's will. And you always want to make sure that you never relinquish your will to another speaker or another human being. That's just my personal input on that. A third frequency that's similar to a challenger, and I'm, I'm kind of going by similarity, but yeah. they're very, very different. The third is the commander. A commander is different than a challenger. A, a challenger will call you up and call you out, but a commander will tell you what to do. <laughs> and what I think is fascinating is when I'm around a commander, they don't even know they're commanding. They command in the simple things in life. They command at home. They command in their relationships, not just on stage. And when you have a commander, what's interesting is that people actually do what they say. You can know you're a commander when, uh, when you carry this kind of authority where people just assume you're supposed to be in charge. And the drive of a commander is, I must move people to action. And the mark is other people look to you to tell them what to do. Now, what's interesting to me is that the, the basic need for a, a healthy commander is trust. What a healthy commander, what a healthy commander frequency does is it establishes a layer of trust. The reason people are willing to do what you tell them to do is they trust that you know what needs to be done right now. Hmm. The high need is actually direction, clarity. What a commander does is a commander brings clarity when people are cloudy. And sometimes a person doesn't need options. Uh, they need clarity of how to move forward well, it, it's funny to me because my um my wife kim uh her frequency is commander there's just no i've been married 40 years and uh, and i can tell you without any doubt her frequency is command and my brother alex his frequency is command and what's always interesting to me is being around commanders they're completely unaware that they're commanding one time we were in a restaurant years ago, my brother and I and a couple of guys, I think there was five of us, the waitress walks by and he goes, ketchup. And she comes back with ketchup. <laughs> and, and I'm the guy going, whoa, hey, hello, hello, can, can, you know, can I get some water? I can't get the waitress to pay attention. My brother just said ketchup and the ketchup came. I mean, the universe obeyed him. And, and then we had this little conversation. We said, Alex, you have command. He goes, no, I don't. He goes, no, you have command. That's your communication and relationship strategy. He goes, I do not. And I said, look, you just looked at the waitress and said one word, ketchup. 
and she brought you ketchup. He goes, no, I did not. I said, excuse me, miss, could you bring me some ketchup? Everyone at the table is going, you did not say that. <laughs> he wow. calls the waitress over and he says, excuse me, when I called you over, did I say, could I please have some ketchup? Of course, she's going to say yes, because he tells her what she's supposed to say. <laughs> and uh, it, 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 it's funny, my, my wife, Kim, when uh, she'll come up at Mosaic and I'll tell her, honey, um, invite everyone to do this, but don't tell them to do it. She can't help it. The moment she walks on the stage, she just commands. And, you know, she's not going to say, would you like to pray? She says, we're going to pray. You know, my, my, and, and when you have a commander, it's just a natural directive language. Their frequency is a language of command. Even when they ask a question, it feels like a command because the frame of the sentence does not hide the frequency of command. But the shadow of a commander is a dictator. Mm -hmm. And that's the shadow frequency. When a commander is focused inward, when their frequency is focused on themselves, they become dictatorial and oppressive and do not uh, respect the free will of other people. They do not establish a basis of trust. They establish a basis of fear, which is very, very different. And let me move um, more quickly. The fifth frequency that I would identify for you is the professor. Be the fourth, right, Erwin? I, let's see. I gave Motivator, you, challenger, commander. Yeah, I skipped one. And, uh, <laughs> all right, the fourth one. And uh, the fourth one is the healer. And the healer frequency is the, the counselor, the therapist, the developer. Uh, people listen to you because... Um, you understand their wounds, you see their wounds, and somehow your words uh, become a healing solve to them. And the drive of a healer is that they, they, they must create a safe space for people to heal. Every conversation for a healer is about healing. And, and in fact, for a healer, they're so uncomfortable when someone commands. And uh, they're so uncomfortable when someone challenges. They're, 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 and they're, not, they're happy with a motivator, but they don't feel like a motivator does enough. And uh, yeah, you got to get into the deep, <laughs> you know, you got to get into the wounds. You know, when you're with a healer, if you ever have a first date with a healer, it's very uncomfortable, you know, because I want to know you, you know, I, I, I want to, I want, I want, I want to see your pain. And you're like, you know, I, I, I just want to get a pizza <laughs> <You know? laughs> and figure out if I want to have a second conversation with you. But a, a healer is always wanting to go deep. A healer is always wanting to want you to do to be authentic and real and, and show your pain. And, and you're like, I'm, 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 I'm not quite there yet, you know? And, uh, but when a healer communicates from stage, it's an extraordinary thing. You feel seen hmm. and you, you, you feel understood. And, and somehow there are words, just a description of the acceptance of your pain and your brokenness and your wounding uh, begins a healing process. And one of the markers of a healer is that uh, others look to you for empathy and compassion. Mm -hmm. and, and the basic need that healers actually provide is acceptance. But the, really the high need that they're providing is wholeness. And, and what I find sometimes is that uh, great communicators um, oftentimes blend frequencies. Uh, but when you have a person who's a healer, uh, they, they'll oftentimes help you see your pain and see your wounds but will not necessarily give you a pathway to find healing in your life. Because the, the challenge is that the pathway is usually painful and it's too painful for them to feel like they're inflicting pain on you. Oh. And so um, the, the, the difficulty there is um, that it feels that when you're trying to give a person a pathway to healing, that you're doing something wrong. The, the shadow side of a healer is, is the guru. And, and the reason I choose the, the, the image of a guru is that the, the guru says, you need me to heal you. The shadow side of a healer is when they need to be seen as the source of healing. Mm -hmm. And they create an environment where they're the singular source for a person's well-being and wholeness. And that's how cults are created when you need that person for your healing, for your wholeness, for your vitality and health. 
One of the powerful things about a healer when they use a positive frequency is they help you move toward healing without them. And so you realize, oh, they're pointing me to my healing, but they're not the source of my healing. And, and frankly, it's one of the reasons I rarely pray for people in like sacred spaces because I don't want people to think my prayers are more powerful or more sacred than theirs. And, when, and whenever someone says, I need you to pray for me, that's my sign to say no. And I usually look at them and go, I'm going to get a couple of people and they're going to pray with you right now uh, because my prayers are not more powerful than yours and theirs. And, and so I, I've worked throughout my life to make sure that no one ever saw me as a guru. I want to help people find a pathway to healing, but I am not the pathway to healing. There's a difference. Fifth uh, frequency is the professor. And the professor is the teacher, the instructor, the mentor. And, and people listen to professors because they, uh, they know that they, they're a trusted source of knowledge and, uh, and information. And, uh, and, and, and a great professor is a person, you know, they're going to give me what I need to know to succeed in life. And, and the drive of professors, I must pass on the knowledge I've acquired. You can know you're a professor when you love to learn so you can teach. You love to learn so you can teach. You just love passing on everything um, that you've learned to other people. And, and you really do see uh, knowledge as the key to success. Knowledge is the key to freedom. Knowledge is the key uh, to find your way forward. And a professor does believe that knowledge is the key to everything you've ever needed in your life. And, you know, motivation, it's kind of superficial. Challenge, it's, you know, it's like a temporary fire. You know, command, you don't need that in your life. All you need is knowledge and skills, and you're going to be fine. And one of, one of the basic needs that a, a professor really tries to meet is knowledge, but the high need is, is competency. What a, pro, a professor using the highest frequency uh, of their frequency is what they're trying to give you is competence. I'm trying to help you achieve competence in your area of uh, endeavor or challenge in your life. And the, of course, the shadow of a professor and is, and, and maybe this isn't quite the right word, but it's the word I use right now. It's, it's the micromanager. Because what happens is that um, when a professor is in a shadow mode, they think the way they know is the way everyone has to know. What they know is what everyone needs to know. The way they have knowledge organized is the way everyone has to have knowledge organized. And they actually become micromanagers of details. And if you don't do it exactly the way they teach you, you've violated the principles that they've given you in life. And so a lot of times for the professor, the information is more important than the engagement because the idea is pure. But the moment that idea is actualized in real life, it becomes impure mm. because everyone knows that action always changes ideas into something far more practical. Mm. But because the professor lives in the world of knowledge, those ideas, those pieces of information are rarely tested on the uh, front line of actual action. And so they go, well, they didn't do it right, but they did it better than their professor because professor actually never did it. Wow. And so there's an expertise and that's why the shadow is a micromanager. You're trying to tell everyone how to do something you've actually never done, but you've studied. The sixth frequency is the seer. And, and I think that um, even though seers are rare, they're more common in, in um, the large stage because, because seers are rare. Mm -hmm. and, and so when you find a seer, when you find someone who's a true like visionary, futurist, pioneer, putting them in front of 10,000 people is actually a real gift to that room because seers are very rare. They might be 5%, maximum 10% of the world culture. And when you have a, a pure seer, a person can actually have a clear sense of the future and the potential in, in the um, unseen and has clarity and uncertainty, that person is incredibly rare. And, um, and their, their contribution to society is really invaluable. You can know you're a seer when people listen to you to paint a compelling picture of a potential future. 
And when you're captured by that vision, uh, you're actually being captured in the universe of a seer. And the POV, the perspective of a seer, is that people need me to show them a future that has not yet been created. It's not about proving that you're right. It's about convincing people that the impossible is possible, that what is unseen can be seen. It's about, in a sense, opening the eyes of the blind. And so seers have this uncanny ability to see what no one can see, but the moment you see through their eyes, you see it too, and you wonder, how could I not see that? And it, it becomes impossible to see once you see it with them. And, you know, one of the markers of a seer is that, you know, do others look to you for vision? Are they drawn to you because your vision of the future in, in, is magnetic toward their lives? And it's a description of their vision of the future. The problem for a seer is that their shadow side can become a perfectionist. And when you have a vision of the future, but you don't realize that vision is like a, an abstract painting. It's not perfect. And even if you have the highest scale frequency of a visionary, your vision of the future is not perfect. And the moment people begin moving toward that vision of the future, that vision of the future changes because now new information is available. There's new experiences involved. There's new dynamics through uh, human engagement. And that vision has to change. And so sometimes when a visionary is working in their shadow, they become a perfectionist because if you do not implement their vision exactly the way they see it, then you're wrong. And one of the, I think one of the great challenges of a seer is not to become a perfectionist, mm -hmm. is to realize that your vision is just that. It's, it's a vision. It's not a detailed plan of the future. And, and it's kind of a, a beautiful thing, though, when you begin realizing that what seers bring to people, it's a basic need, is hope. And what people really need in life is hope. And what visionaries, whatever the vision is, what they're saying is the future is going to be better than today. Hmm. That your tomorrow is going to be better than your present. That you can be better than you are. And so when that visionary is actually giving vision, what they're actually meeting is this basic need for hope in your life. And then that high need, if I could just go there, is like is, is for enlightenment and innovation. When a visionary is working at their highest frequency, it's not that a person sees a different future. It's that they see a different self. And all of a sudden, you begin to see yourself differently and humanity differently. And it moves you to a level of enlightenment of things that you once thought were impossible that now are just simply possible. And then the seventh frequency, and I, I'm just downloading way too much information. In but just it's so a few good. Moments. It's so and good. The, the seventh frequency is the maven. And the, the maven is the theorist, the expert. And I hesitate to use this here, but um, the maven, it would be what would be considered um, the genius. And I don't mean the genius in IQ. A lot of people can have a really high IQ, but their IQ is, um, is really uh, data-based. And uh, they're, um, they're great at gathering massive information. They're almost like a human computer. And, um, and I think what, what a maven does is that uh, a maven does something that violates reason. They don't come to a natural conclusion based on data and information. They, they violate a, um, our view of reality and see things that seem to be wrong when they see it. And, and then later, um, history proves them to be right. I, I think that, you know, Nicholas Tesla was a maven. And, um, you know, da Vinci was a maven. When you think about da Vinci uh, painting submarines and helicopters hundreds and hundreds of years before any technology could actually support that level of vision of the future. That's what you find with uh, a maven. And, and you know, on, on a lower level, um, a maven is someone that others look to as an expert in their field. And so you can kind of be, a, in a sense, um, a baby level maven and not be da Vinci or Tesla. And, um, but, um, but what people look to is they, they, 
I would say mavens rarely define themselves as geniuses. Mm. They, they don't think that they're geniuses. They think that other people can't see things clearly. Wow. It, it's, it's, it's a very, very different perspective. And, and what, what people need is this level of clarity to see reality differently. And, um, and, the, and the drive, I think, of mavens is uh, to violate everyone's view of reality. It gets to destroy these false views of reality so that people can um, can see what really is. And um, the basic need of a maven is really is clarity. They're just trying to see things as clearly as possible. And they're trying to get people insight um, on, on a particular subject or domain. But really, the, the high need, um, and that's why mavens are important and they're rare, is paradigm shifts. It's those moments where we have to see reality differently. It's the shift from Newton to Einstein. It, it, you know, what is interesting to me is that, you know, Newton was right about a lot of things. He was just wrong about everything. <laughs> you, you know? and, uh, it, it's, it, I know it's, it sounds like a contradiction, but you can be right about a lot of things and be wrong about everything. Like you can be right about how gravity works and not understand and be completely wrong about why gravity works the way it works. You can go, everything in the sky will drop. Apples drop. If you jump over a building, you drop. And the reason everything drops is because there's a goddess at the center of the earth that pulls everything downward. <laughs> and so you're actually right about gravity, but you're wrong about reality. Hmm. And what mavens do is they go to the realm of reality and change our minds about what's real. And that's how everything shifts. And so they're very impractical mm -hmm. <laughs> and, uh, until the reality shifts and then they become incredibly uh, valuable. The, the shadow of a maven, I think, is that they're, they're a pessimist. And, and the reason for that is that um, there is a potential arrogance that can, you know, seep into a maven soul. And then you believe if you can't solve it, nobody can. Mm. And if you can't see it, no one can see it. Mm. And, and I think one of the great challenges of, uh, of a maven is to realize there are other mavens out there. <laughs> and uh, and um, their view of reality might actually violate yours one day. And, you know, I, and I think that's why sometimes what happens in innovation is that the person who was actually the, um, you know, the genius that, that birthed an innovation is usually one most resistant to the next innovation wow. because it doesn't occur to them that their thinking as expansive as it was, was still limited. And they, they, they just created a new benchmark for the next level of genius. I think that's why it's always so important to remember that your finish line may be the next person's starting line. Those are the, the seven frequencies of communication. And, and, and by the way, you know, a really in-depth process of that is available in the arena, uh, which is our uh, online community. And also, if you wanted to, you could actually just buy the product. Um, but I've given you a pretty strong summary of all seven frequencies. Guys, I'm blown away right now because I've known some of it, but I haven't known it at this level. And I know you guys probably have a thousand questions just like I do. And I'm going to do something and I haven't gotten Erwin's permission for this. So I'll just ask for forgiveness later. I am so excited about his book coming out, his book called Mind Shift. Awesome. It, is, it is going to be out of this world. And if you go to 10xstages.com forward slash mind shift, Erwin, I have to throw out some bonus with it. So you're just going to have to trust me on this bonus. Okay, Erwin? I just okay. got it. Okay. You just got the book. I just Come got on. the book. Come on. <laughs> it's just gotten, guys, right now. So this is what I want you to do. I'm asking you guys see how his mind thinks. His mind thinks. I know you have a ton of questions about what he just trained. Anybody who picks up the book, I don't, I've never done this. I want you to email me one question at Pete at 10 xstagescom Pete at 10 xstagescom 
I'll compile those questions, Erwin, and I'm going to get the most commonly asked questions that people have around what you just taught about, because I have like 20 questions, and I'm only going to ask two or three of them. But if maybe we just do some way of maybe you can just shoot a, a, a Zoom or shoot a recording of some of the most common questions. This is only for people who pick up MindShift. Like if you pick up a copy, you pick up multiple copies, I'll figure out how to correspond with Erwin to answer some of those questions because we don't have time to answer those questions today. And I have so many of them, so many of them, but make sure you guys go to 10xstages.com forward slash MindShift. I want us supporting this book. I bought one for everybody in my mastermind. I have, I just, I just believe in this guy's mind. And Erwin, I'm going to have you teach on a piece of it too, just one piece around it here in just a second. Let me just ask you a couple of questions. Can Without and I know we've got a limited time, but can people be multiple frequencies or are there a primary one? No, uh, what I think is really important here is that um, seven frequencies is not based on a fixed mindset, it's not based on your one frequency and that's what you are all your life. You have a core frequency, and I think you have a cluster. And if you develop, and that's why it's so much, it's so important to go deeper than this. Um, your goal should be to be, to be able to activate and actualize all seven frequencies, at least three to five frequencies at some point in your life. And when I listen to some really dynamic communicators, like I listened to like an Ed Milet. I, when I listen to Ed, I hear commander and healer at the exact same time. And I, I think what happens sometimes is when we listen to certain people and go, wait a minute, which one are they? And what they have been able to do is actualize two frequencies that they merge. And you feel the 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 power and authority of command with Ed, but you also feel the compassion and, and tenderness of the healer with Ed, and, and you find them working at the same time. And I think it's really important to be able to understand that you are a dynamic being, and all seven frequencies are available to you at some level. And, it's, and if you're going to be a, a communicator on stage, you should be using at least two or three of them. Wow. I love that. Guys, that's probably one of the most important questions. And a lot of you asked that question. So I'm going to leave it at that. Let me play with this. I knew Kim, I knew Kim's commander was her, her core. What's Irwin's core? I'm wrestling. I think it's Seer, but then I think it's Maven. But then some of me says Professor, but then I'm like, Professor's eliminated. What would your core be? Uh, ironically, when I was putting together seven frequencies, uh, the last one that I identified was Maven. And, and so I had five and then six and, and I was going, well, wait a minute, where do I fall? And I was actually struggling with myself. And I realized the reason I couldn't see myself is because I'm a maven, but I hadn't really accepted that. And sometimes it's hardest to see yourself. And, you know, and I, and I started looking back 20 years ago when people would ask me, you know, what, what do you see as like your your goal or your calling. And I would literally say, my mission is to, is to violate your view of reality. <laughs> and that was actually my stated mission in life. And I look back even to my childhood, because my son asked me, did you be, because my team would say, you're a maven, there's no question. And, and, but my son said, were you always a maven or did you become one as an adult? And I actually realized the reason I was in a psychiatric chair by the time I was 10 years old is that I was a maven and I didn't see the world the same way. And I couldn't understand the world the way other people saw it. And being so different actually made me feel psychotic. Mm -hmm. And until I understood how God designed me and created me, that's when I was able to begin to use that frequency to help other people rather than to be self-destructive. That's incredible. Guys, I think a lot of you said it here because we're, we're streaming this also to grants. Uh, on Twitter space, and we've been getting unbelievable engagement there. Yeah, I bet he's, I bet he's a little challenger. And I, I bet he's challenger. I bet he's got a commander in him. I don't know if you've heard uh, Grant, we're on Grant's channels right now. Would, would those be the two that resonate with you, Erwin? On him? For Grant Cardone? But I haven't listened to Grant enough to know. Okay. And, uh, but um, lots um, of people are putting challenger and commander in there, because he likes to say he's your uncle, that's going to tell you the the things yeah. that you need to be doing. From my immediate like um, Instagram moments watching Grant, 
what comes across to me without hearing a word is commander. Hmm. And that's like, that's the frequency that seems to be dominant to me. And, but, but again, I don't know them and I haven't listened to a lot of the things. So I'm just giving you my, my, you know, blink impression. What, what would you think my core is, Erwin? You know, Pete, I actually, I know other people are saying you're a motivator. I actually think you're a healer. Hmm. And, um, um, I think that one is that your personal healing is very, I think, core to your narrative, you know, and, um, and I actually think you want to create a space where people feel safe and comfortable and loved and accepted and valued. And, and so you might have others, you might be a motivator. Um, you might, you know, but I actually think you're a healer motivator that that's, that's kind of like the space I would put you in. What, what do you think you are, Pete? Yeah, man, I, I I didn't even think healer. I thought, well, people are saying I'm a motivator. Um, I feel like there's elements of me that see things that other people can't see too, like a vision, like, like I'll get a vision and people are like, man, that is the craziest vision. And so part of that's the seer, but you're right. Like I want to create a safe place for people to be able to heal too. So yeah, yeah I went back and forth probably with motivator and seer, but I can see what you're talking about with healer to create that space. And, and that doesn't mean you don't have seer. I'm just saying that um, environmentally, what I what I, I look at the environments people create. So when I had a chance to be at Wellspring in Ohio with you guys, um, what I felt dominantly was this is a place where you can heal. This is a place where you're safe. This is a place where you can be honest and and be real. And and so the frequency I felt environmentally was a healer frequency. Wow. That's cool. That's awesome. Erwin, I want to ask you one final question. And guys, I want you to like, go pick this book up. I've picked up hundreds of this book. I encourage you to buy it for a friend. But Erwin, what is one thing in the book that you would say is getting in that you talk about in this book that's getting in the way of our potential um, of what really the potential that really exists within us? Well, I mean, I, obviously, I think every chapter is really uh, critical. Um, but, you know, I just I just finished one of my Zoom calls with my one-on-one -on -one coaching. And one of the things I had to do with the guy was uh, chapter three and saying, you can't take everyone with you. I think one of the great challenges as you continue to grow and change and develop is that um, a, lot of, a lot of really good, kind, loving people try to take everyone with them. And then they feel so much pain and they feel like they, they're betraying people and they, and because they're trying to take everyone with them along the way. And one of the things I had to learn in my life is not everyone wants to go with you. And the, and the, and the metaphor that comes to my mind is there are people who live in, in Wyoming and Idaho and South Dakota, and North Dakota. And the reason their ancestors picked that spot is they were going to California and they decided to stop. <laughs> they decided to stay there. They were all going to California, but they didn't make it. And when you're going to California, you can't expect everyone to go with you. Some of them are going to stay in Wyoming and in Idaho, and, and some of them are going to go to North and South Dakota, and you can't understand why. But if you don't let them go, you will let go of your own destiny. And so you have to then decide, are you going to stay with the people who stay in Wyoming, or are you going to keep going to California and realize you're going to have to develop a new community and a new circle of friendships and partners in life. Man, I needed to hear that today. I don't know about you guys. That's just chapter three. I needed to hear that. But just this mind shift that we've got to have to stop healing our head, hitting our head on the ceiling. Like you're five foot, you keep hitting that five foot ceiling. You're six foot, you keep hitting that six foot ceiling. There's so much more out there. And what he just said, it, it, it I didn't even know that was chapter three. But I know that in two situations in my life right now where that's occurring, and and in order for me to go where where I feel God is calling me to go, I have to think about that and look at that. And so, listen, this is what I want to do. I saw I saw somebody say I've already, I just ordered ten. I pre-ordered. I pre-ordered. It's coming soon. I want to not just give you the replay of today because I think you got it. Every time I listen to Irwin, my wife says this too. I, she always goes back and listens to Irwin like three or four times. And, and that's powerful. Like that's a compliment to just the, what he teaches. And so I want you to email me. I don't have a page set up. Email me at Pete at 10 xstagescom Tell me and be honest. I've ordered one book, five books, 10 books. 
and I'll make sure we send you back to the recording because we do not give this recording out. This is not a recording that we give out. I'll give you the recording of this. And I want you to ask me one question that you have around the frequencies. And I'll compile those questions and maybe Erwin and I are together and I'll just record a few answers to those questions from Erwin's perspective. But I want you to go pick up the book. Hey, who's left with us? Who's picked the book up already? Who's already pre-ordered, bought some copies? I want Erwin to see that. Drop it in the comments. I did, I did, I did. Like, And some of you said 10. Some of you, I've seen somebody say 25. So thank you for that. Erwin, just as you're, as we kind of depart here, today has been so good. Every time with you is so good. And I'm so grateful for you. I, I actually, you know, I, I I know the Maven, but I also, I think you help people see things and you don't give them the answers too. I feel like there's such a seer in you too, because I, uh, and you don't give them the answers usually, like you have them go see it and experience it themselves, but there's so much I could say about this, but just your final thoughts today with everybody with the book, I want you to talk about the book too, but just your final thoughts uh, today as well. Just personally, one of my uh, life, um, directives is to elevate the way people think. And, you know, the, the core of mind shift is that, uh, in fact, there's a whole chapter that's called you are your own ceiling. And most of our limitations are dominantly internal. And I think the, the first page of the book simply says this, uh, the intention of this book is to destroy your internal limitations. And if, if you could just begin to focus on the internal structures within you? Are they driving you towards success or failure? You know, I'm a person of deep faith. I'm a person who is a follower of Jesus. And I also understand that God created us as thinking creatures and he created us to create. And if we can understand that choosing is the most spiritual activity that we will ever engage in, your choices create your future. And the strength and health of your choices will determine the strength and health of your future. Hmm. Guys, I'm so excited about this that I've just in the background told my team, Erwin, when, when will the book start shipping? I'm getting that question a lot. Uh, the release date is October 3rd. October 3rd. So guys, y'all will be the first to order. And I'm, I'm going to make sure that we drop this to in our entire database. This is being streamed everywhere, but this is one of those books that I don't drop often. I think I can count on a couple of fingers how many times we're going to make our entire database aware of this book. This is one of those books because I think it's going to break the, uh, change the game for you and break a lot of those lim uh, internal limitations that he's talking about that are going to think have you think at a higher level, maybe even feel like a genius as the book subtitle says, um, when we can break those internal limitations. So Erwin, thank you for today, man. It has been so good. One of my favorite shows that I've done on Backstage with PV3. So thank you for the gift that you've given us today, man. Hey, thank you guys so much. Thanks for having me. God bless you. Bless you, man. Guys, what, a, what an incredible show today. Wow, my mind is blown away. Um, I would love to know for all of those that are live, just drop, tell us what your, what your big takeaway was from today. What was your big takeaway from us today? If you're listening to this later on, tag me and let me know that this show that this show really made an impact on you. It made an impact on me. Look at that. Those are my notes from today. And I know for those of you listening to the audio, you can't see that, but it's the most notes that I've taken on a show. And I'm going to tell you what, I ordered the book. So I also get the email, email of the recording to me. I haven't gotten a recording either. So it's not that you don't get it. I don't get it, but I'm going to make sure that I get this recording and listen to it multiple times because I believe what Erwin said is so true. As you begin to understand the audiences in which you speak to, and you can begin to incorporate, like, I agree, like, don't just be known for that one core. When you become gifted and talented at communication, it's because you can incorporate three or four or five of those. I do see the healer more than I've seen it, but I'm also a seer and I'm also a motivator. And there's pieces of me that are also a challenger. And when I begin to understand my audience and what my audience needs, and I understand how to use these frequencies, it allows me to be more powerful when I'm not living in the shadow of that. And that's the other thing, taking a, a, a true look of when I'm being in the shadow. My wife tells me when I'm being that shadow person. The people in my life tell me when I'm being that shadow person. 
The Holy Spirit tells me when I'm being that shadow person. But when you become more powerful is when three or four or five of those just become so natural. Yes, there will always be a core, but three or four or five of those become so natural to you. And now what you know what you do? Your communication can really change the world. Erwin, I've experienced the maven. I've experienced the seer. I've experienced the professor. I've experienced the motivator. And quite frankly, I've experienced the challenger and the healer. I don't know if I've ever experienced the commander, um, but maybe that's because he's married to a commander. But I've experienced six of those pretty profoundly in his communication style, which allows him to be a world-class communicator. And it's going to allow you, and it's going to allow me to be world-class communicators. So I hope that you enjoyed today. I thoroughly enjoyed today. I thoroughly enjoyed today. And please go pick up his book, 10xstages.com forward slash mindshift. 10xstages.com forward slash mindshift. Make sure you email us your question that you have in regards to today. I'll compile those and get some, some answers and we'll make sure and send out that Q&A uh, to, our, to our community as well. And also to make sure that you get the recording of today to be able to go back and watch it too. So guys, I'm excited next week. I believe on the show, we got Gary Brecka from 10X Health. We're going to be talking about the power of what one stage did for him and the one thing that he did to prepare for the biggest stage of his life. I'm also going to be asking him if you could give us just three things that we need to do to optimize our health. What would you boil those three things down to? So next week's going to be incredible. Thank you for today. I know we went a little longer today, but I'm trusting you guys loved it as much as I loved it. Go pick up Irwin's book, 10xstages.com forward slash mindshift. Love you guys, and we will see you next week. Thank you.